Today I'll be reading The Opinion of the Supreme Court in Donald J. Trump, The United States. Decided July 1, 2024. Chief Justice Roberts delivered the opinion of the court in which Justices Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh joined in full and in which Justice Barrett joined except as to Part 3C. Justice Thomas filed a concurring opinion. Justice Barrett filed an opinion concurring in part. Justice Sotomayor filed a dissenting opinion in which Justices Kagan and Jackson joined. Justice Jackson filed a dissenting opinion. This case concerns the federal indictment of a former President of the United States for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office. We consider the scope of a President's immunity from criminal prosecution. Part 1. From January 2017 until January 2021, Donald J. Trump served as President of the United States. On August 1, 2023, a federal grand jury indicted him on four counts for conduct that occurred during his presidency following the November 2020 election. The indictment alleged that after losing that election, Trump conspired to overturn it by spreading knowingly false claims of election fraud to obstruct the collecting, counting, and certifying of the election results. According to the indictment, Trump advanced his goal through five primary means. First, he and his co-conspirators used knowingly false claims of election fraud to get state legislators and election officials to change electoral votes for Trump's opponent, Joseph R. Biden Jr., to electoral votes for Trump. And when that failed, on the morning of January 6th, they repeated knowingly false claims of election fraud to gathered supporters falsely told them that the vice president had the authority to and might alter the election results and directed them to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding. Fifth, when a large and angry crowd violently attacked the Capitol and halted the proceeding, Trump and his co-conspirators exploited the disruption by redoubling efforts to levy false claims of election fraud and convince members of Congress to further delay the certification. Based on this alleged conduct, the indictment charged Trump with 1. Conspiracy to defraud the United States in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 371, 2. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding in violation of Section 1512K. 3. Obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding in violation of Section 1512C2, Section 2. And 4. Conspiracy against rights in violation of Section 241. The district court denied the motion to dismiss, holding that former presidents do not possess absolute federal criminal immunity for any acts committed while in office. The district court recognized that the president is immune from damages liability in civil cases to protect against the chilling effect such exposure might have on the carrying out of his responsibilities. See Nixon v. Fitzgerald. 1982. But it reasoned that the possibility of vexatious post-presidency litigation is much reduced in the criminal context in light of the robust procedural safeguards attendant to federal criminal prosecutions. The district court declined to decide whether the indicted conduct involved official acts. We granted certiorari to consider the following question. Whether, and if so, to what extent, does a former president 
enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office. Part 2 This case is the first criminal prosecution in our nation's history of a former president for actions taken during his presidency. We are called upon to consider whether and under what circumstances such a prosecution may proceed. Doing so requires careful assessment of the scope of the presidential power under the Constitution. We undertake that responsibility conscious that we must not confuse the issue of a power's validity with the cause it is invoked to promote, but must instead focus on the enduring consequences upon the balanced power structure of our republic. The parties before us do not dispute that a former president can be subject to criminal prosecution for unofficial acts committed while in office. They also agree that some of the conduct described in the indictment includes actions taken by Trump in his unofficial capacity. They disagree, however, about whether a former president can be prosecuted for his official actions. Trump contends that just as a president is absolutely immune from civil damages liability for acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities, he must be absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for such acts. And Trump argues that the bulk of the indictment's allegations involve conduct in his official capacity as president. Although the government agrees that some official actions are included in the indictment's allegations, it maintains that a former president does not enjoy immunity from criminal prosecution for any actions, regardless of how they are characterized. We conclude that under our constitutional structure of separated powers, the nature of presidential power requires that a former president have some immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts during his tenure in office. At least with respect to the president's exercise of his core constitutional powers, this immunity must be absolute. As for his remaining official actions, he is also entitled to immunity. At the current stage of proceedings in this case, however, we need not and do not decide whether that immunity must be absolute or instead whether a presumptive immunity is sufficient. Section A. Article 2 of the Constitution provides that the executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. The president's duties are of unrivaled gravity and breadth. They include, for instance, commanding the armed forces of the United States, granting reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, and appointing public ministers and consuls, the justices of this court, and officers of the United States. He also has important foreign relations responsibilities, making treaties, appointing ambassadors, recognizing foreign governments, meeting foreign leaders, overseeing international diplomacy and intelligence gathering, and managing matters related to terrorism, trade, and immigration. Domestically, he must take care that the laws be faithfully executed and he bears responsibility for the actions of the many departments and agencies within the executive branch. He also plays a role in lawmaking by recommending to Congress the measures he thinks wise and signing or vetoing the bills Congress passes. No matter the context, the President's authority to act necessarily stems either from an act of Congress or from the Constitution itself. In the latter case, the President's authority is sometimes conclusive and preclusive. 
when the president exercises such authority he may act even when the measures he takes are incompatible with the expressed or implied will of congress the exclusive constitutional authority of the president disables the congress from acting upon the subject and the courts have no power to control the president's discretion when he acts pursuant to the powers invested exclusively in him by the constitution if the president claims authority to act but in fact exercises mere individual will and authority without law the courts may say so in youngstown sheet and tube company v sawyer 1952 for instance we held that President Truman exceeded his constitutional authority when he seized most of the nation's steel mills. But once it is determined that the president acted within the scope of his exclusive authority, his discretion in exercising such authority cannot be subject to further judicial examination. The Constitution, for example, vests the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States in the President. During and after the Civil War, President Lincoln offered a full pardon with restoration of property rights to anyone who had engaged in the rebellion but agreed to take an oath of allegiance to the Union. But in 1870, Congress enacted a provision that prohibited using the president's pardon as evidence of restoration of property rights. Chief Justice Chase held the provision unconstitutional because it impaired the effect of a pardon and thus infringed the constitutional power of the executive. To the executive alone is entrusted the power of pardon and the legislature cannot change the effect of such a pardon any more than the executive can change a law. The president's authority to pardon, in other words, is conclusive and preclusive, disabling the Congress from acting upon the subject. Some of the president's other constitutional powers also fit that description. The president's power to remove and thus supervise those who wield executive power on his behalf, for instance, follows from the text of Article 2. We have thus held that Congress lacks authority to control the president's unrestricted power of removal with respect to executive officers of the United States whom he has appointed. The power to control recognition determinations of foreign countries is likewise an exclusive power of the president. Congressional commands contrary to the president's recognition determinations are thus invalid. Congress cannot act on, and courts cannot examine, the president's actions on subjects within his conclusive and preclusive constitutional authority. It follows that an act of Congress, either a specific one targeted at the president or a generally applicable one, may not criminalize the president's actions within his exclusive constitutional power. Neither may the courts adjudicate a criminal prosecution that examines such presidential actions. We thus conclude that the president is absolutely immune from criminal prosecution for conduct within his exclusive sphere of constitutional authority. But of course, not all of the president's official acts fall within his conclusive and preclusive authority. And we will be covering that next episode, which I will have posted before you know it. Until then, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.